This episode was sponsored by NFT Ventures Miami. Join the NFTV mailing list for the sickest drops. Welcome back to the World Crypto Network. We're joined by Travis Urig, and we're talking curio cards. Uh, Travis, for the people that don't know, about four years ago, you and I and Rhett Creighton uh, worked together on a little project called Curio Cards. We tried to do the San Francisco startup thing. Uh, we were all very focused on it, and uh, we made some, uh, at the time, we called them collectibles, blockchain collectibles on the Ethereum blockchain. And uh, then, you know, we went on to other projects, and they just kind of sat out there, and, you know, dust grew over the library. And uh, what happened next, Travis? Curio Cards had gone to sleep, as far as I knew. Yeah, we didn't call it at the time NFTs. But you go on anywhere now and, and look up the word NFT. It's it's an extremely hot topic. Uh, you know, interesting thing. Everybody, there was a Saturday Night Live skit on NFTs. I don't know if you saw that um, recently. I, I and love that. I love that sketch. I was totally. Bored. I think they did a pretty good job. I mean, there's there's definitely like the the natural layer of uh, SNL cringe on it, but I think they did a pretty good job. My favorite party says prices go up and down. You see, <laughs> that's correct. Yeah, it's, it's accurate. Yeah, with this, this thing we, we did, which came out of some art show projects that had happened before, uh, is suddenly historically uh, interesting to a lot of Ethereans because it's it looks to be the very first time anyone did an, an art NFT on Ethereum. I never felt comfortable saying that before, the first, because you know you never know. The only reason why I even thought we were first for the longest time is I went to a, uh, in New York, there was Rare AF um, conference and uh, CryptoPunks was there, which I love CryptoPunks. And the guy was talking, he's like, oh yeah, we're the first uh, art, you know, crypto uh, art on, on Ethereum. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. Uh, when did you guys come out? And he was like, oh yeah, it was like June. And I'm like, oh, we, we came out three weeks before that in May. And I wasn't trying to like cause trouble because I they were wildly more successful. They were, it's a really cool product and they did a really good job. But that was when I realized that, oh, okay, maybe there was something something to the timing on that. Um, you and, see, you know, I've, years I've later, been, I've been wildly confident ever since we were included in the ERC 721 standard. Uh, again, yeah. a thing that doesn't mean any but anything normal people, but to me, as a mm -hmm. historian, as a computer person, uh, in the standard, they name checked us and rare Pepe's. They said that these are collectible NFTs with similar properties to rare Pepe's and Curio cards. And from yeah. then on, I was like, whether the, I never thought we'd have monetary success for the project, but whether we get any credit at all, I was like, these guys found our project helpful. And as a historian, yeah. I'm like, they built upon the blocks that we left and that's why we made those blocks. And I'm glad that they did what they did and everything that came out of 721. And then now I guess it's called 1155 or something. Uh, but mm -hmm. anything that comes out of these standards, I'm just glad that we could contribute even in a small way, like having the cards be a single token that couldn't be cut into part pieces. Cause we were like, it's a card. You can't sell me half a baseball card. I don't want that right. want a full card or nothing. And you know, things like that became just part of the standard. So I was always happy with it, but yeah, just like you, I saw the NFT craze take off and I was in a clubhouse room and, and people were, you know, going real crazy about NFTs. And I, I just kind of dropped it on. I was like, Oh yeah, my friends and I did a project with NFTs in 2017. We did all this stuff. Bup, 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 bup. And I was like, yeah, you should know that. And this isn't where you know people got it. They didn't discover it from that, even though I said it for sure. Uh, but it, it was so it was so fun uh, that they found our project and that they enjoyed it and that they appreciated it. Uh, but Travis, maybe a little on the background, how how did it happen? How did they find Curio Cards? Yeah, and and what you're saying about the the EIP, you know, 721 uh, was for the longest time, I figured like that's Curio's mark on history. Like that's it, that's the thing we did. Extremely proud of that because Curio always had a kind of, its purpose was to find a way to, for artists to sell their work. We weren't, I mean, you start a, an FT project today, you're thinking like, oh cool, I'm gonna get investors. I'm gonna create a business. This is gonna be a big deal. NFTs is a huge market. We we have all these charts and data and, sh and studies that show people want NFTs. And there's all these artists that are interested in it. And there's all these standards and there's all these you know, trading houses and all this stuff. That wasn't why we did it. None of that existed. We did it because we're like, there's this thing we know about on Bitcoin, Rare Pepe. And 
boy, that'd be a really cool idea to apply to like original artwork. Um, uh, and by what I mean about that is is artwork that you know designed that is not following an existing theme. Uh, and I obviously know all the rare Pepe artworks were original artwork, but they all kind of were were one type of art. And we thought, well, this could just be something that any artist could use. Um, and, and it was it could it be was a way a deal to to go with no theme like we did. Mm -hmm. As yeah. you can see, the first ten everything years, before that had a theme or like a mm -hmm. test card, but to go with no theme where we're like, okay, we're doing Robeck one week, we'll do Marisol Vengas another week, mm -hmm. crypto pops, uh, crypto graffiti. And it didn't have to be crypto art. We were very cautious about that because crypto graffiti and crypto pop, obviously their art is about crypto, right? But we were very intentional about, we want to have people on here who are just uh, traditional graphic artists, you know, for lack of a better word. And we also want people here who um, don't even know anything about Ethereum because it was sort of that meetup origin you know, we, we did the meetup group together and part of the meetup group was finding ways to get people to use Bitcoin and Ethereum and crypto um, who had never used it before. So we had this angle like, well, the artists will have some Ethereum after this. Uh, their audience, their fans, they'll have some Ethereum after this. They'll have some cards. This is like a really great way to get people involved. It was like, it's like an outreach uh, program almost in a lot of ways. It was an, it, it was this huge educational component to it the whole well, way. If you, if you like Dogecoin and you're like, okay, Dogecoin's fun, has a dog on it, you can send it around. Mm -hmm. You would love NFTs because it's like, I'm giving you a collectible Dogecoin. And yes, it has mm -hmm. you know 10 cents of value and maybe one cent or whatever. I don't, I wasn't so much focused on the value of the Dogecoin or the value of the curio cards of the NFT. It was more, you have this collectible. I had it. Yeah. I had it in my wallet. I sent it to your wallet. It is yours now. You know, you can send it. You can keep it. You can whatever. It, and that explains Bitcoin to you. This is like a way of understanding mm -hmm. Bitcoin with a, a less serious asset, um, yet at the same time, a unique asset. Yeah, I was talking about this with somebody recently, and I, I think an easy way of the way I'm thinking of it right now, what Curio was, essentially had like three parents. Uh, one of its parents was Rare Pepe's. Another one was the uh, Bitcoin art show that we were doing and the uh, Bitcoin uh, craft show that happened before that. And just the idea of like, there are people out there who are like creating art about Bitcoin or selling it for Bitcoin. And then the other parent was Doge, uh, Dogecoin, because we wanted it to be fun. We wanted it to be kind of silly. We wanted it to be like very low stress, very chill. Um, the first website was like blog, a blogger, you know, the first mascot was something off Fiverr. Um, it was a cartoon character that you thought of. It was, um, we wanted to keep it fun and simple because like everything was getting real serious at the time. You know, we were, it was 2017, ICOs were starting to happen. I don't think they'd been happening when we first started, but there were things like them. Um, the way, definitely the felt while we were doing it. Is that everyone else was running up these ICOs where they were claiming that they were stock certificates or they were claiming that yeah. they were useful or they were serious somehow. financial yeah. instruments. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. We were like, no, 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 we're going to crank up baseball cards and we're going to mm -hmm. do 20 or 30 different runs of individual baseball cards. And there was a time where I actually worried kind of like a liability, like that we had actually created like 30 different ICOs basically. Yeah. I remember that. We didn't say they're valuable. We didn't say they're stock certificates and none yeah. of that was ever said, but as far as a, a copy, we of, were kind of an early ICO we, as well. Yeah. On we accident. Up like 20 or 30 ICOs and uh, yeah. you know, certainly never profited, never gotten any trouble for them. But yeah, as, as yeah. far as a technical thing, uh, our, yeah. our ERC 20 tokens that were cards were very not, there's hard to distinguish from the ER C20 yeah. tokens that were stocks or, or whatever people. Call and the them. way we sold them, um, ICO started doing that more, more as well, like through a smart contract. We sold them through a smart contract. You'd go, you'd give the contract money and whatever multiple of money the card you gave, it'd give you that number of cards back. Um, so if you gave it like enough money for five cards, you gave you five cards back. And that kind of like buying directly from the smart contract was the theme in the later half of the ICO praise was buying it from the, from the chain, right? Um, and I, I, I remember when, when we realized that, oh, actually they're doing it the way we did it. But since the money was all for the artist, it was more like, it was more like selling goods. It was more like a, a store than it was an ICO, but it had the similar technology involved. Oh, Rhett, Rhett, Other thing we did on, on accident. I was, I was totally thrilled with everything that Rhett did and his amazing work mm -hmm. on this project, setting all of yeah. that up, doing all of the smart contracts, all of the code is all Rhett, all Rhett Creighton. And so mm -hmm. he did great work. Very ahead of its I think time. It lends into the next question. So um, 
as we were saying, uh, you know, we sold these cards for a dollar. There's a series of probably cringeworthy YouTube videos where you and I introduce yes. cards each week and kind of desperately try to sell them to people without uh, great results. Nobody uh, wanted them. But, I remember too, like punks, they gave their cards away free at first. They're punks for free. Nobody wanted them. They were free. Anybody could just take them. And now they're like more than millions of dollars. But the same thing happened though our, with our vending machines. Uh, they were kind of abandoned. They were left out there. Yeah. The cards that didn't sell were left in the vending machines. And, uh, you know, Rhett went on to other projects and you went on to learn programming and other projects. I went on uh, to travel Europe and do interviews and, and other projects. Uh, but what happened to these cards in the vending machine? Yeah, so this is the rediscovery. Uh, it's sort of like an, uh, there was a rediscovery and then there was an art restoration uh, initiative. Uh, but the rediscovery happened first. Um, there were some people on Twitter, uh, uh, Die Aping and Harry BTC. I think Die Aping is when we found it first. And they were in some Telegram group or something. And their goal was, let's see if we can find the first NFT, uh, art NFT on Ethereum. And they went like digging around a Wayback Machine and doing like targeted Google searches like and, per and month. It wasn't, and, it wasn't just historical inquiry, though. I think that's part of it. Uh, the other early NFTs, like you say, the Crypto Punks, I think it was Moon Cats or Crypto Moon Cat Rescue. Yeah. And that those were found, discovered, and became incredibly valuable. Uh, mm -hmm. the, a treasure hunt. There's treasure yeah. at the end of the, so, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's why if you can find one earlier, um, the sooner you, you figure that out, the better for us. So I don't have to keep going around lying. And I'm like, oh, the first one ever. And it turns out I was, you know, it's bullshit the whole time. Um, if you can find one earlier, there's money in that. So like the, the hunt is on. Um, but people have been looking really hard and, and Curio is the one they found. And to Die Aping's credit, right. he's the one who figured it out first. And, and he didn't just buy them all. What did they do? Yeah. Well, this is the coolest part. Like at this point, Mooncat Rescue has happened. CryptoPunks has had a, has, has happened. You know that these are valuable. You could buy them all up and be the market. Uh, Dieping found them. He figured it out, bought a couple just to like, figure out how it worked. And then he told people about it. He told them how to do it. He sent guides and instructions. And he's like, you know, here's the steps you follow. And they were like, you know, they put it on Twitter and all these threads and, and it, Everyone got really excited figuring it out and they found the other vending machines because there were 31 vending machines um, that you could buy, potentially buy cards from. And a lot, some of them were sold out, but not that many of them were sold out because like the cards didn't do that great in 2017. And it was 30 cards, but there were 31 because there was like a, a 30, an extra one that we didn't even know about. Um, that was just like a mistake with how early Ethereum development worked. Um, and they found them all and they, and they figured out how to buy from them. I had removed all the information in the website on how to buy them because, you know, the, the, the shop was closed. You know, if I could have turned off the vending machines, I would have, um, because it was just like, it was almost like a liability at that point, because I don't know what's gonna happen to that money. It was just kind of sitting there and so like, okay, well, this is the full run we, we finished. And so they had to like figure out how to actually get the cards out of the vending machines too. And the card contracts, there, you you can see that code. That code is available on was available on EtherScan. But the vending machines weren't. Uh, their card wasn't available on EtherScan. Not out of any like hatred of open source. It was just more like it wasn't important at the time. It wasn't a thing people really did very much. And the vending machines they were only important while you were selling for like a week. Um, I'm sure the code existed somewhere, but it wasn't on on EtherScan. So they had to like reverse engineer how to get cards out of these things. And they figured it out. Uh, they 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 found um, old tweets, old you know. They found the original Bitcoin Talk forum post uh, where we explained how it worked, and that was like that was the way you announced a project back in the day. You went on the Bitcoin Talk forums. If you weren't on the Bitcoin Talk forums, you weren't a serious project. Um, now I don't think anybody really uses it. And they went the comments, into get his comments on that forum are rich by the way yeah. you can go back and read the skepticism yeah. when we announced oh, this yeah. project and compare it with the, the current situation it's quite and that skepticism was not contained just for the comments i'll tell you that um but the website was always open it was always open source so like they went into the git history on the website and like rewound back time and found the the ending machine addresses and the instructions before i moved from the website so there was like some serious archaeological work involved to figure this thing out and they did all this without any really really not knowing for sure if they're going to be worth anything and also dealing with actually um some misinformation they thought there were a hundred thousand uh 
of some of the cards, like cards one through like 13 or something. We minted 100,000 of them, but we never sold 100,000 of them. That was just like, let's just make a bunch and then we'll figure out how much to sell later. Um, and we burned the rest, but it was actually kind of hard to figure that out. So for a while, they actually thought these cards were um, more plentiful than they were and potentially worth way less than they are worth because like 100,000 cards, that's, you know, that's a lot of cards. That's potentially, you know, very little value. So they, they, there was definitely like a profit motive to find the project, but once they found it, a lot of people were just kind of the thrill of the hunt, you know, the, the, the thrill of discovery. Well, and, and that lasted for a little while, but eventually mm-hmm. somebody came in and bought all the cards because yeah, the somebody cleaned them out are, are just full out empty. And, and like mm-hmm. you say, we even had a misprinted error card and they, they bought all of that one too. Uh, the card so, that I didn't know about. They were like, hey, what about this 17B? And I'm like, there's no 17B. What is that? You're getting scammed. Um, <laughs> and it, I know it's, it's a real card. Because the 17 card is also the UASF card. Oh, my God. Uh, by CryptoPop, yeah. which was a fork, and Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash split off, and there's all kinds of drama and all kinds of stuff. So it was really just kind of a happy accident uh, that Rhett's error came up on this, the fork card. Yeah. When... People assumed it was intentional because of that, because the 17, card 17 is about forks and there are two of them. And they thought like, oh, this is like an Easter egg that they did on purpose. And I'm like, yes, of course. Uh, well, but no, and I actually thought for a while, I told people like, well, don't buy it because th- there must be something wrong with it, right? The only reason why we would have deployed it twice is if there was a mistake. My first guess was we used the wrong IPFS hash. Cause I remember that did happen. There was a card that was deployed with the wrong IPFS hash, but that one never went up for sale. So it doesn't matter. Um, turns out that wasn't the case in 17B. It appears that it was a totally perfectly fine card. It just was um, accidentally deployed twice because Red had deployed six contracts each week and there were no deployment tools. Like, you know, nowadays the develop- Ethereum developers, they use something called Truffle or they use something called Hardhat and they have all of these tools. They can run local test nets and they, there's a lot you know, the automated testing suites. None of that stuff existed. So, a lot of projects, they kind of, they, and also it was really cheap to deploy on mainnet. Now it costs like a lot of money to deploy on mainnet. I had to deploy the new wrapper recently and it was very expensive. Um, but at the time, it was a couple of bucks, no big deal. So you just kind of like would deploy your test code on mainnet, try it out. And if it worked, then you'd deploy the real one like a week later and just only tell people about the real one. You wouldn't tell them about the test one. And I guess this, is, this has come up with CryptoPunks and with Mooncats where people have found test code. Uh, earlier well, and that, and that used to well. be good enough you used to have that sub- security by obscurity and like we were talking yeah, about an Ethereum project the game that came before us uh, they went through and they bought all of the land from the game that was the one, and yeah. then they found out there was a second or earlier version of the game where the, the guy had changed some stuff and, and re-rolled it you know just done a new one and they went back mm-hmm. and bought all the land from the earlier version of the game too it was really cool and now that land is more important than the real land um, because it still represents that rarity, that scarcity. It's like the test code is uh, so valuable, you know, like those little test attempts. And uh, uh, 17 wasn't the only one that was deployed twice uh, because of mistake or or whatever. A couple of them were deployed twice, but 17 was the only one that the vending machine was also deployed. It was the only one you could actually buy. The other ones are just um, inaccessible or, or they don't or it's zero like the contract exists but then we're made something like that so now that these people have found the vending machines and they figured out how to send their ethereum and how to get back their erc 720 mm-hmm. tokens uh what are they going to do now so the, the the main issue was um curio cards is referenced in you know the uh for the erc 721 standard and and one of the things it says right in that is like these projects are not compatible because we are before, you know, we predate them, right? And they have a lot of features that uh, we did in Curio. So for instance, uh, the non-divisibility of the individual NFTs, um, being able to buy it directly from the contract, uh, we uh, use the vending machine, but nowadays like, think about like a crypto kitty, right? You, you mint the kitty, you, you, get, you give money and a new kitty gets created. Um, so that element, uh, the IPFS hashes, so the artwork that represents the card, it has like this fingerprint called a hash. And the common way of doing that nowadays is to use this thing called IPFS. And we did that. Um, 
there's some other element to it. There are like three or four things that like were called out as uh, having um, contributed potentially to the, they don't really detail how it was inspired, but they're, they're listed. And the downside though to that is we're not compatible. Um, when you're older than the thing, you're not the thing. So the, after the rediscovery had, had finished and everybody had the cards, a lot of people were trading them peer to peer, but they took a lot of risk doing that because it'd be like, hey, uh, I got e, you got card number 17, um, send it to me. And you'd be like, okay, give me your ETH. And I give you your ETH, my ETH. And then like, I have to trust that you're gonna send me the 17 and that you're gonna send me the right 17 because there's actually two 17s. Um, and there were people doing like escrow trades and stuff like that, you know, like, oh, this, we trust this guy because he's done a bunch of other trades. So we'll go through him. But it's not like a great system. It's not how people want to interact with their NFTs. It's not how they interact with NFTs. So the art restoration part of the project was then born, and that is to make Curio cards compatible with new tools and new sites like OpenSea, which is a, a very popular NFT third-party auction house marketplace. So that's what we did. We started building a wrapper. And, and that's what a wrapper is. It's just a bit of jargon. But all it does is it takes your native, you know, modified ERC-20 Curio card, and it inserts it into a modern standard NFT. Uh, the standard we're using is 1155, which came out after 721, but it, it's the same thing. It's just a way of doing NFTs. It's very compatible and well-supported. And so once they made the wrapper, they opened up the Curio cards market and you could sell them? Yeah, we... There's, there's the wrapper itself. There's also a, a web page that'd be built for that wrapper. Uh, the original uh, Curio cards has gone through a couple of design iterations. The, the original Curio uh, was someone you found on Fiverr, I believe, um, who like released it under like a, a public domain license or something. I like the, um, the, sure. the cartoon raccoon. Uh, he has the yeah. infinity symbol around his eyes, just as mm -hmm. I suggested and described. Uh, so I, I was pleased with it, but I, I also like the later versions uh, that your friends worked on as well. They're very nice. Yeah, one of one of the people who were then was an artist as well in Curio later on. They uh, nobody, you know, wasn't like a, they just really wanted to make a, a newer version of the logo. Is that kind of like everyone was just kind of helping out mentality. So they they made an updated version of Curio, the 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 raccoon, and uh, they came back to design the wrapper. Uh, web page. So this is a site that you use to actually wrap your cards. And it, it, has a, it has a really cool feature where you can bulk wrap and bulk unwrap, which is really nice because you might have like hundreds of cards. And if you had to like wrap, pay the gas, wrap, pay the gas, wrap, pay, the, it would take a long time. So it can, you have to approve all 30 cards. So you do have to do like that one time you have to go through like, okay, approve card one, approve card two, or, or just whatever cards you have. You know, if you only have five, then you have to do it. But after you do that once, you can bulk wrap and unwrap your cards whenever you want. And once they're wrapped, you can just take them straight to OpenSea. There's a link on the webpage, curio.cards, to bolt the wrapper as well as to OpenSea, um, where it's a verified listing at OpenSea. So you can also just go to OpenSea and type in curio cards and do the one with the blue checkbox. And people are buying and selling the cards just like we always dreamed. So it's also yeah. really neat to see, like you say, the curio cards community. Uh, they've developed a lot of uh, tools and things to make Curio cards more usable. Uh, they had like a gallery tool. You could check your address, see what was there. Mm -hmm. uh, the people were counting the different versions of the cards. So you can get an understanding of how many cards there are available, which ones were burned, uh, which ones mm -hmm. were lost or destroyed. And that kind of thing uh, has all been driven by the community. So it's been great to see that. And just a, a day or two ago, um, a leaderboard webpage came out. I don't know if you've seen the leaderboard yet, Tom. I did. Uh, yeah, uh, one of my goals for Curio cards always was uh, going back to baseball cards and magic cards and other things like that is uh, to collect a set. And the idea mm -hmm. is that because we numbered these cards one through 30, they were a set. And that, you know, sure, some of the artist ones are also mini sets inside that set. Uh, but I thought it would be really neat if someone would try to collect all of the curio cards all 30 and like you're saying thanks to the leaderboard board tool that was designed by the community you can now check and there's at least three people uh, who have complete sets of curio cards yeah i think there's probably maybe a few more people that have complete sets because the leaderboard it only shows for wrapped cards 
because the raft cards are just a lot easier to program for. Um, so the leaderboard, it kind of serves two purposes. One is incentivizing complete sets, which as you said, was always like, oh, that'd be really cool if people like were drawn and motivated to get a complete set. Um, and the other thing about it is it kind of incentivizes people using the wrapper. If you want to get on the leaderboard, you got to wrap your cards. So it, it's possible that the leaderboard is expanded to support non-wrapped cards as well. There's no like technical limitation. It's just hard and takes time. But also I kind of like that it's motivating people to uh, update their cards because the more they get wrapped, the more we have an understanding of what cards still exist. Um, there were a lot of people who bought cards back in 2017 who have no idea what's happening or they've lost their wallets. Um, these were not worth anything at the time. They weren't that popular at the time. Uh, I think people think that I have a lot of cards, but you know, our job was to get people to buy cards. Like, our job is to get other people to buy cards. So uh, a lot of the early cards, it, we don't even have them to give them out. They are, people bought them and then potentially forgot all about the project. So hopefully we can get the word out to those original holders and let them know, hey, pull your old wallets out. Uh, so I created a, there's a documentation page as well. If you go to docs.curio.card, it kind of walks you through how to access your cards in the old original 2017 format and get them loaded up into MetaMask. Well, and also when we were running the cards, you had to actually buy the cards. Uh, Rhett put all the cards in the vending machine. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted mm -hmm. them, you had to buy them and you had to have Ethereum mm -hmm. and all the other stuff. And uh, it was a lot of steps for people to do. Mm -hmm. And they were uncertain about it. They'd never done this kind of thing before. They weren't even very comfortable with Ethereum or comfortable with Bitcoin yet. And you were telling them to, to buy this whole nother thing. So it was, yeah. it was a tough And, and we didn't have MetaMask. There was no MetaMask. There's no Uniswap. Like Uniswap and MetaMask are the, the two most biggest board facing things about Ethereum for a lot of people. And neither of those things, exist. I guess MetaMask technically existed, but it was like a beta project or something. It wasn't really well supported. Everyone used my Ether wallet. And so we, we had a fork of my Ether wallet. I think we're actually potentially the first people ever to fork my Ether wallet as well. Um, but that's a little bit less clout. Uh, on that particular claim. And as you said, yeah, we, well, we had to buy enjoy them. That. I enjoy that fork very much. Not having to enter in your addresses into the thing yeah. uh, was a that really was big. convenient feature. It was really yeah. nice. Before the fork, because we launched without it, before the fork, you had to go into my Ether wallet and manually load uh, the addresses for each card in order to see your cards. And it's just a very technically involved process and it didn't really go towards the goal of the project, which was to make this easy to use. So we, have, so we forked the wallet and we hard coded the addresses and that was extremely useful for sure. But yeah, we, we had to buy cards like anybody else. There was no ICO, there was no uh, royalty cut thing. Um, all the money went to the, and, you and know. we didn't have was, like a bunch of company money to buy these cards yeah. with and we weren't well off or whatever. We work hard yeah. enough, but uh, yeah. When you said, when you said, if you look at the comments on the forum post and there's a lot of people saying like, what is this? You know, what is this? It's just, I can just download the image. That conversation I had with a lot of potential investors as well, just trying to explain to them like, no, look, there, there are projects that have done this before on Bitcoin. There is the potential here for digital artists to monetize their work. And they just couldn't do that before. You, even, even on the Rare Pepe, you had to draw Rare Pepe if you wanted to do that. I, I heard a quote recently I think it was on a Planet Money episode about NFTs. And they said like before NFTs, if you're a digital artist, the only two ways you could make money was to uh, work at a video game company or work at Pixar. And like, that's it. Uh, or, a, or DreamWorks, right? Some kind of knockoff of, of one of those two things. And now with NFTs, you can just sell your work directly as if it was a physical piece to real collectors. And that was not something that people were, were seeming to get at the time. And uh, there was a lot of conversations trying to say like this, this could be something, we could build a platform, this could, we could release more artists, uh, we could get a support team and a moderation team. Um, and yeah, those conversations did not go well. The same way the cards, and so the same way CryptoPunks tried to give their cards away for free and nobody wanted them, they wouldn't pay the gas. And at the time we're talking pennies. This is not like gas today. It wasn't even worth it for people to do it then. Well, and I don't want people to get discouraged because I think it's important to have early projects like this. And I think yeah. it's important to have Bitcoiners that were out there spending Bitcoin and giving away mm -hmm. dollars worth of Bitcoin that are now worth thousands of dollars and other things mm -hmm. like that. I think 
that is what moved the project forward. And that uh, by our experimentations with CurioCard, the guys who wrote the 721 standard were able to see it as a working project and to say, hey, there is some interest in this. Maybe not a lot, mm -hmm. but enough to write a standard. And then that leads to other people coming along and say, hey, there's a standard. We should use this standard. We should make some stuff. And, and again, it just grows and grows. And I think that the internet and the world and humanity, we learn from the successes and the failures. So I think it's exciting to see this project uh, restored and respected. Uh, one of the things you didn't mention is that we're now, uh, you and I and Curio Cards and Rhett are a part of the Wikipedia entry for crypto art. Uh, so that's right. Yeah. Entry. There's all these little and, great little, the, and that, that's the reward for me, um, having yeah, worked on is. something that was inspirational and influential and useful and artists got, you know, paid and collectors got art and standards got written and Curio got referenced. It, it was a success in regards of like in the fullness of history, you know, I, I think that's the lesson there is you try a lot of different things and and some of them work and some of them don't. And if you try a lot of things on crypto, uh, sometimes all you have to do is wait four years and it'll be a success anyway. And uh, what do you have planned for the future of Curio Cards and what are you going to work on next, Travis? So Curio Cards was intended back in the day to become a platform where anybody could release a Curio card the same way Rare Pepe did that. They had a, a process, you could submit artwork and they'd buy the artwork from you and they'd you know, release your cards. And uh, there is code that exists out on Ethereum that even allows people to make Curio cards uh, that anybody can use. Um, but that's all pre-modern NFT standard code. So I, I wouldn't recommend anybody use it. There are way better platforms now. So if you're a, a new aspiring artist and you're like, wow, that sounds really cool you should go on one of those new platforms. There's a lot of really amazing websites to do this, like Rarible, OpenSea, Maker's Place. They all have um, tools to help you launch your own NFTs. For Curio, I think the, the important thing now is to make them fun and easy to use, kind of finish that original vision. Uh, they trade right now, which is always the thing we wanted so desperately. People would actually be able to trade them and be using them and like, hey, hey, uh, you got, I'll give you three, you know, 14s and give me 126. And like that has happened. And people, people are doing that. They can't even picture this, but there was no marketplace for NFT. No marketplace. We, yeah. we would have had to make the exchange ourselves. There was a thing called mm -hmm. Ether Delta that we were trying to work mm -hmm. with. But it was the same problem as any other distributed marketplace where you say, okay, I'm selling one for 10 bucks. And then you just wait and there's no one to buy it and you can list it for nine bucks or eight bucks or whatever. There, there was no market maker. There was yeah. no action. Uh, it there was no Uniswap. No. There was no open C. We toyed the, the thing that we wanted to do was build a marketplace so the trading could happen, but that was a much, much bigger project. So we had to talk investors and things into it. And, uh, Ether Delta, as you mentioned, that was like, oh, cool, there's a DEX, you know, because we weren't going to get listed on Coinbase or something for each individual card. It was not practical. So we, we were like, we need a DEX. We need some on-chain way of trading cards. And Ether Delta was that solution for us. But it was really buggy. Uh, it was not a great platform. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we, Curio, found two or three bugs in Ether Delta because how weird, are, I don't know if you remember this, there was a, a bug where Ether Delta didn't understand non-divisible cards, which is Curio. Curios are non-divisible. You can't buy half of a Curio. So there was a bug where if you did like a tricky order, you could buy a card without buying a card or sell a card without selling a card. So you'd get the money um, and the card, or you'd lose the money and the card. Um, and people were doing stuff like that. And we had to, once you figure that out, we like told people to stop using it. Uh, I lost some cards in Ether Delta because again, like our job was adoption, right? So I took some cards and I put them on Ether Delta to seed the market. You know, like, oh, cool. Now people can buy them and trade them. And they were stolen. <laughs> um, there's a website now called Fork Delta, which, which people can use to try to access the original Ether Delta contracts because they're all still on Ethereum. But yeah, we did this without any kind of marketplace. And now the marketplace exists. And that is just so rewarding and makes me just so happy to know that you can now go on OpenSea you can look up Curio cards and you can buy and sell your cards and people are buying and selling their cards. Um, there was like 200 ETH in trade volume in like the first day and a half. I think at this point it's probably like 260 ETH uh, in trade volume. Uh, it's only happened, you know, like last week or something that the, the wrapper went up and that just blows my mind. 
especially because the community voted on a 1% artist royalty. So OpenSea has this option where you can choose a fee. And we could choose zero, or we could choose one, or we could choose five. But no matter what, we had to choose something. So we did a vote because that just makes the most sense. Uh, when somebody set up a snapshot page, and based on how, how many cards you had, you could like vote on the outcome of this thing, which is how snapshot votes usually work. It's the same way, you know, Uniswap votes, for instance. Um, and they voted overwhelmingly, like 97% to 3% voted in favor of the idea of a 1% fee, 100% artist royalty. So all the trades, recent trades uh, that happen on OpenSea, um, there'll be a payment that'll happen in a, in a couple of weeks because OpenSea does their payments every two weeks. And it'll go straight into a multi-sig account that we've set up that the artists control. The artists are the signers on their multi-sig and more of them are getting signed up on the multi-sig right now. And they'll be able to split the funds between themselves and um, have that kind of ongoing revenue, which is like even more long-term positive impact that Curio is having, which is, just makes me so happy. Yeah, it's, it's really great because it was a really honest project where we did want to help the artists and we had the tech knowledge and they had the art and we were coming together mm -hmm. and everyone was going to benefit. And to see it continue now where it is helping the artists and it's also setting a good example for the community about how to set these things up and how to reward the artists directly. Uh, it's just a very rewarding project and mm -hmm. it's great to see it rediscovered. And there have been donations of cards. I donated some cards, other people donated some cards back to the original artists who didn't all have some of their cards. So they all now get to go on this, this adventure together with the curio holders. And um, that just makes me really happy that this is now, it's fulfilled that promise that we, we made four years ago of being useful to artists, useful to the community and having a kind of a long-term positive impact beyond just inspiring later NFT projects, which I was always very proud of by itself. That's, that's great, Travis. And where can people learn more about your work and keep up with what you're doing? Uh, if you want to follow me directly, I'm on uh, Twitter at Travis for Mayor, F-O-R, Travis F-O-R Mayor. And Curio is on Twitter as well at my Curio Cards. And you can find links to that Twitter on the webpage, which is Curio.Cards. Uh, the webpage when you go to Curio.Cards is a 2017 classic. So some of the information might read as if it was from 2017 but you'll see links on the nav bar along the top to go to the new pages as well. We have the leaderboard, there's a gallery, there's the wrapper, there's OpenSea, there's a documentations page, and there's the gov for governance link. All of those links are new, built in just the last couple of weeks. And you can learn all about that on the website, on the documentation, on the Twitter. Well, it's, it's never too- Oh, and the Discord, the Discord too, the Discord. Uh, which is linked on the Twitter, it's on the website. It's like the Discord invite link slash curio cards. Uh, I'm on it. The die aping is on it, Harry BTC, the people who found the project, they're all on it, and we'll answer any questions you have. Well, it's, it's never too late for San Francisco to have a really good mayor. So there's always hope <laughs> for that. Uh, but right. thank you so much, Travis, for joining us. It was great to talk to you about Curio Cards and NFTs. And I hope we'll be able to do a follow up uh, interview in the future. Uh, maybe when we'll have more to report and we'll be able to mm -hmm. just tell people where NFTs went from here. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really great to be able to hang out with you again. Thanks so much. This episode was sponsored by NFT Ventures Miami. Become an NFTV artist. Sign up today. Easy bit. Easy bit. Easy bit. Bitcoin ATMs. Easy bit.